Dear Heavenly Father, um, thank you for keeping us safe throughout the week, Father, and uh, help Good. Oh, it's already December. <laughs> Bless each other. Okay. <laughs> Give them big hug. Bless in Jesus' name. All the children. Parents, and introduce yourself. Yeah. God bless you, Rizal. Bless you, Yohan. Bless you. Mm. <laughs> God 
God bless you. Yeah, along with jogging, walking becomes very popular. You know, when I walk, I noticed uh, some people are just relaxing, listening to the music and look around the scenery. It just takes time. But some people, they just focused on the path they walk very fast with sweating. Christian life begins with a step of faith. I think it's the same. Some people are slow. They take time. What we call in the Bible, intellectual faith. So they're trying to get to saving faith. Some people are rushing. Try to obey the commands of God. What He says in the Bible. Try to live the way what He wants to be. But that step of faith leads to a walk of faith. You know, Paul describes many things, especially in Ephesians. You know, walk worthy of life. Walk not as Gentiles do. Walk in love. Walk as people of light. Because we became to know who Jesus is. And at a certain point of time, we just confessed our faith. And we received Jesus as our own Savior. That is saving faith, because Jesus came and died for me. He forgave my sins, so that I have eternal life. You know, Paul is talking about in chapter 4, the, the first part. How we please God. You know, Paul says in Col Colossians and the book of Corinthians, whatever we do, do it for the glory of God. Same thing, real issues, it comes down to, am I pleasing to God right now? If I do this, would God be pleasing to me? We always think about in His perspective. So that's the the matter of attitude Christians should be. Because Christ lives in us. So the moment we are out of the boundary of Jesus Christ, we do because we still have a sinful nature. So how do we please God? Paul is talking about the first part of the chapter 4 in Thessalonians. First is uh, live in holiness. John 8, 29, this is what Jesus said, I always do what pleases Him. You know, the before and after in the book of John, chapter 8, He said, whatever I speak, that's what I heard from my Father, I only speak. Same thing as actions. How we please God, first of all, he's talking about living holiness. You know, as you all know, the moral climate in the Roman Empire was not healthy. And the immorality was a way of life. And the Greeks are worse than Romans. One of the Greek historians says, we keep... Uh, prostitutes for our own pleasure. Then we keep concubines for our needs of our bodies daily. And then we also need wife. Why? Wives give us uh, legitimate children. And then faithful guidance for our own children. So that's the atmosphere and environment in Greek. In this place, the Thessalon Thessalonica. 
So think about growing in that culture. The message of gospel and message of Christ is what? Purity, faithfulness. Those things are foreign to them. So I thought about today's life, the United States. Immorality is a way of life, nothing different from back in nearly 2,000 years ago. You know, the Southern Baptist, the stat came out throughout the United States, throughout the United States, we have 481 nations. 481 nations are representing the United States. And then language, we are speaking here, 327 different languages. So you don't have to go anywhere else here in the United States. If you learn other languages, you pick the state. Fly over and learn. You know, the California itself is a 215 languages, especially in LA district. And New York is a 180 languages. So LA is more diversified. We have more different languages are spoken here. So think about that. Whole population in the state of California is now 35 million. And then 85% of people don't go to church. So what does it tell us as Christians? Same as the situation atmosphere was in Greek, Greek culture. It's totally foreign to people from outside of the Christianity. This country is based upon the Christianity, but no longer this country is considered to be Caucasian country and Christian country. So when we read the Old Testament, same. People migrated from other countries. They brought their own gods. So it is, that's why it's hard to evangelize. So the strategy must be changed as Christians. We just talk to them directly, hey, do you, do you go to church or do you believe Jesus? Otherwise, you know what will happen to your life. We cannot say that. Same thing happens in Greek. They just come to the church and getting to know who Jesus is, but because of their cultural background. So what should we do? That's what we should pray about. How do we reach out people? Unsaved people, unsaved souls. Because we know who Christ is. But what about other people? See the compassion. You know, now even today's church, holiness, we just set the guidelines and we try not to fall and not to make sin. But think about that. There, if there is no guideline, then we fall immediately. So real issue is what? If I do this, God, am I pleasing to you? If I say these things to my friend, would you be pleasing to me? I think that's the bottom line. Am I pleasing God? You know, Hebrew says that without the faith, you cannot please God. That's the God's definition, God's perspective. 
So am I pleasing God? The beginning of thinking actually comes from our faith. Meaning what? Jesus Christ came and died for me. He cleansed my sins. I am no longer a sinner if I am in Christ. Am I having an assurance of salvation? If something happened to me right now, can I go to heaven? You know, just this is a moment of thinking or just a split second. We need to make a decision. On a daily basis, how many decisions do we make? Fall, get up, obey God's command, disobey. Those conflict. Until the Lord's return, we cannot be perfect and we can be pure. So Paul is asking, the way you speak and the way you act are pleasing to God. In any moment in our life, soon as we wake up, we need to pray to God. Whatever I'm going to do, whoever I'm going to meet, God, I want to please you. Put your word into my mind. And Holy Spirit, guide me. Control my hearts and minds to do something to please people and please to you. See, we always constantly think about God, otherwise we cannot act like God. That's the beginning. So long time ago I mentioned coming together is beginning. And then what's the next one? I, I mentioned four things. Keeping together is unity. The next step is what? We need to think together. That's a progress. And then working together is success. We bring the fruits in our lives, not only in our lives, but as a whole, the church. The holiness, we cannot be holy. But God's command is holy, as I'm holy. Yes, Lord, <laughs> I'm going to be holy any moment. We can. That's what Paul is saying there. Are you pleasing to God? Because of immorality is a way of life in Greeks. You know, the Greek man thought was that as long as he provides the meals for the family, he's okay. He's a very faithful man. He can do extramarital relationship as long as he supports his family. So today's situations, we, we need to think about that. So what is holiness? Paul is saying and asking us, whatever you do, you do please God? Do you please God? See, we have God through the Spirit. He's watching over us. And then secondly, he just changed the subject from holiness to love, actually. So walk in harmony. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 
you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. You know, the transition from holiness to love is not a difficult one. Because the more we live like God, the more we will love one another. So actually, verse 6 here, he said, if Christian really loves his life, a brother, he will not sin against him. You know, by the way, there are four basic words for love in the Greek language. As you all know, first is eros. It refers to what? Physical love. Number two is a storge. It refers to family or parents' love. And then, you know Philadelphia, right? Phila. Actually from phileo. It's the love of deep affection in friendship or in marriage. And then finally, agape. It's a God's love shows toward us. But the first two words are absent in the New Testament. Only the author used either philia or agape. Agape is a sacrificial love. Romans 5, verse 5. He already demonstrated his love through Jesus, who was crucified on the cross. That's our kafe love. We die for somebody. We die for not only the family, but totally strangers. Can you do that? I can. I cannot die for others. But God's command. So whether we submit our will or not, that's the matter of our choices. The moment we submit, if I don't agree with God, but my will is already submitted to God, then the Holy Spirit empowers us to go through that step. So that's the mystery. So James said that faith without good deeds a dead faith. So in other words, all, you know, many, many Christians today, we only have intellectual faith. We know who Jesus is. We know what God says in the Bible. But it doesn't come to me. You know, I'm trying to apply the principles of God in our lives, but it's not easy. So I'm not sure whether I'm saved or not. I'm not sure whether really Jesus died for me or not. That's an intellectual faith. We must exercise and practice His Word in our lives. One of them is love. Because God is love. Live in harmony. We need to love others. Jesus said that what is used that you love only people you know. That's not love. Love we must love. That people that we can't. So what is God, God is asking us? It's not easy. But what is God's nature? God's nature is love, right? Fish and animals, they don't attend the school to love their natures. What is fish nature? Swim, yes. What about an eagle? Fly. What's Christian's nature? What did Peter say? What do we have in our nature? Christians, we have divine nature. That is God's nature. We do, we have. God's nature is what? 
to love, agape love, to sacrifice. Even in our marriage, how many times do we need to sacrifice each other? If one side doesn't yield, then what's going to happen? Everyday conflict because of my pride, because I'm a man. But what is God's nature? You know, one of the classic examples, Jesus said that, I came to this world to be served not to serve you. Is that what Jesus say? Not to be served, but to serve you. God says that to his own cre creatures. See, if you and I are Christian, that's the attitude we should have for other people, toward other people, because Peter says, we have, we share divine nature. Divine nature is God's love. God says, I am love. No, God himself is love. In that way, we can live harmoniously. We can walk harmoniously, even in the church. So the question is, how does God cause our love to increase more and more? How do we do that? How does God do that to our lives? By putting us into circumstances that force us to practice the love. It's love, right? Do you have a difficult person in your life? Yes, we do. You pretend, no, I don't have any. <laughs> right next to me. Whenever I see his or her face, oh, my heart, there's no peace. God causes that opportunity for you to exercise his love. So God has a reason for me and you to put in this situation. You know, love is like the circulatory system of the body of Christ. If our spiritual muscles are not exercised, the circulation is impaired. So, do I love my brothers and sisters in the church, as a body of Christ. You know, Paul gives that figure. We all have different gifts and strengths. So he compares the parts of our bodies, hands, eyes, and nose. If one part is impaired, the circulation is not going to be smooth. Same thing as a healthy church. We need to work together to cooperate each other. The source is the love. So Paul is talking about pleasing God and then it changed into love. Because the more we live like God, then it's not, it's not hard for us to share the love of God with others to make harmonious life. And then he comes down to the next living honest. In Colossians 4, 5, I want you to remember this scripture. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. You know, Christians not only have the obligation to love one another, but also to be good testimonies to the people outside the church. 
Paul is talking about here, honest as he's working himself. He was a tent maker. He doesn't depend on other people's life, in other words. You know about Greeks. The many, many young believers in the church had a wrong concept of the Lord's return. As if the Christ is coming tomorrow, so they gave up on everything. And then they said, why don't we enjoy our lives? It's no use for us to work because Christ is coming tomorrow. And then they totally lean on the work of their slaves. So what Paul is trying to say is here, be honest. Being honest means what? If you and I are Christians, we don't interfere other people's life. And do not get them into trouble. Just leave them alone. We need to live the way what God wants us to live. We need to show them who we are. The identity. We are Christ's followers. It doesn't matter whether you believe or not. I believe in Jesus. So I obey His command. So in other words, in and out of our lives are transparent. I don't hide anything. I have no shame in Christ. Because He forgave me everything. What I've done in the past. He's only counting the present life. What you're doing right now in God's eyes, in Jesus' eyes. So they will have a confidence and boldness. But we live two lives. One life in church, one life in home. Two different lives. It's not easy. See, God has given us power to rule over evils and devils in our lives. But we lean on the power of the darkness more. So that we'll have a defeated life every day. So it brings us back to the, the, the basic questions. Am I pleasing God? If I do this, God be pleasing. I see the God's smiling face. So what Paul is saying here, as Christians, we must be careful in our relationship with those who are not believers. So it requires spiritual wisdom to have contact without contamination and to be different without being judgmental and proud. So if we lack this wisdom, we will do more harm than good. In other words, the words we say is different from the action we take. It doesn't match. That's why Paul says, do not be stumbling block for others. So it all comes down to one question. Am I pleasing God? If I do this, if I say to this, am I pleasing God? What about his face now? staring at me or smiling at me. We need to think about it. So Paul is encouraging young believers in Thessalonica. 
I know you're living in that corrupted culture, but it's not your fault because you grew up in that today's culture life. Because the message of Christ, purity, faithfulness, holiness, is totally foreign to them. That's why we need to be very wise to those who are not believers. They have no concept of Christianity. They have never heard about the gospel. So how do we do that? How do we approach them? See, that comes our assignment and homework. Building our relationship with other people in order for us to spread the gospel. So it's the matter of our lifestyles, how we live, how we act, how we must be patient under some circumstances, and how we speak. I'll summarize this, a holy life, if I do this, would God be pleased? And harmonious life, am I the one who makes the body of Christ to be loved? And an honest life, am I living wisely so that those who don't know God could see me as God's child? So we have only four weeks to finish this, this month and this year. You know, this is a, such a crucial time. Every December, we celebrate Christmas. But this is the opportunity God has given us to look back what He has done to our lives. And what have I done to God? You know, next month is January 1st. Every first day of each year, we give what? Promise, resolution, right? So this remaining four weeks, if you have time, just kneel down and pray. And think about and looking back, even this year, what God has done to me, done to my loving people and family, or friends, and the church. And then ask God how I can share your love to others. Show me and teach me. Without harming, without disrespecting their cultures. Let's pray. Father God, we live such 